And I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker tonight is Dak Kitlis. He is uh, being involved in commercializing the innovation for the last 15 years. And he moved to the Bay Area two years ago um, to become an um, entrepreneur in residence. And when two years ago was a very eventful year. He moved here with two young children and a pregnant wife. And he had to go through two shoulder surgeries while he was trying to get his company funded. So it was very eventful two years, but here he is. And you can read his official bio written on, on, on this. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Doug. Thank you. Before I get going, uh, just a quick funny story. We, we, as a part of creating what we think is a new category called the virtual personal assistant, we were joking about what, what is a good tagline? How do you sort of summarize what we're doing? And somebody came up with, I think it was Tom, one of my co-founders, he said, let's call it periodically or practically human. We said, well, you know, we know we're not going to be able to live up to that in, in the early stages of this. What about periodically human? So yeah, we figured that, that was it. We're gonna, we're gonna, the, the version one is going to be periodically human, and the, ne the next release is going to be practically human. The release after that's going to be who you call in human. <laughs> and ultimately, the release after that we think is going to be kill all humans. But we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll see how it evolves. Uh, I want to introduce one of my co-founder, Adam Chire, who's uh, also... Uh, the real brains behind this have uh, been working on these technologies along with uh, my other co-founder, Tom Gruber, for at least 15 years. Um, there's also a lot of people to thank in this room that have been involved in a project called Kalo, which I think a lot of uh, people, uh, there's at least some people from that project in the crowd, and uh, that's a large AI project that spun out of, or that uh, was a DARPA-funded project from SRI. So let me give you just a quick overview, and I'm going to do a demo of what, what we're doing, and I think we're going to go to the uh, panel talk soon after. So I mentioned just briefly, uh, we're spun out of SRI. Uh, we're a small company still. We've focused on taking that, that uh, giant leap from taking a very interesting set of technologies, and one of the things we talked about literally half an hour ago as we were talking about what, what our message should be up here is, which technology should we talk about? There's so many involved with keeping things as simple as we're trying to make it that you can really spend a lot of time on each element of it. Uh, we have an incredible team. Uh, we're keeping it small until we're ready to launch, which is about two months from now. And we raised uh, an early round of funding about a year and a half ago, and we're raising our Series B now. Uh, I'm a wireless internet veteran. I've been commercializing innovation for some time, uh, all the way from the early days, actually the beginning of the wireless internet in Scandinavia at a company called Telenor, which is sort of Norway's version of AT&T. They're the large incumbent wireless operator. Uh, my two co-founders, uh, Adam and Tom, have both been working in AI for decades um, and had some good success in various commercialization process around elements of the technology. Uh, I mentioned briefly that the, co the core IP of the company was born out of a lar very large project uh, of which there's about $200 million of funding from, from DARPA. Um, there's elements of that technology that um, Adam and a, a team of people about five years ago started to create what we call a, a clean sheet rewrite of some of the elements of the technology that were most interesting. and starting to commercialize, asking yourself the question, if we had to build a commercial product with this technology, what would we do? And let's start building that now. So that's about five years in the making. The, the core elements of it are uh, natural language and dialogue, the interpretation and understanding of what somebody's trying to do, and the delegation of, of that to a set of services on the internet, of which there are billions of dollars of investments with brands we all know. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you in about two minutes uh, what we mean by all this. 
Uh, we came out of uh, stealth, hibernation, whatever you want to call it, uh, a few months ago uh, at the D7 conference with, with Walt Mossberg and had some nice validation along the way as it pertains to the technology and the direction and the vision, which I think also, uh, I suspect a large number of people in the audience have been involved with some element of trying to start commercializing AI uh, into real products that have meaning in people's lives. So what is it? Um, we believe there's another chapter coming in the way that people interact with information and actions. Uh, we, if you look back at the history of, of the major paradigms, uh, we believe that there's another chapter that's coming and, and within around five years time, uh, many people, especially those with sort of the connected online life, will delegate the menial tasks of their life to a virtual assistant. So some of the early visions of this were consistent with a vision that, that, that Apple came out with with the Knowledge Navigator 20 years ago. Um, clearly there's a lot more work to do to get to that ultimate vision, but we're taking the early steps. And the, the question that you ask yourself as an entrepreneur and from a timing perspective and a technology perspective is not just what can you do with the technology, but what can you do to make it useful and have that validated in the market. Before I get into some of the technology, I'm going to show you a demo of Siri. And at the end of the day, what Siri does is create a virtual assistant out of your mobile device for, for chapter one. Um, if you can pop up your phone and interact with it in a, in a natural way with in, in anyone who's been in the, in the internet business and in the mobile business knows there's key input challenges like texting and triple tapping and, and what if we added speech to it? And is speech good enough now where a lot of people can use it and it works well enough where you ad adopt that as the way, the primary way of inter interacting with your phone? And the answer so far seems to be yes. We think that the technologies and the, the testing that we have with a small group of users shows that people quite quickly, a great number of them migrate to using speech. So let me give you some examples of what, what it does. Uh, the early version is about limiting, of course, this isn't a search engine, so you don't ask all questions under the sun. You say, a virtual assistant understands with a pretty good degree of, of, of accuracy certain domains. So things like, in our case, movies and events and businesses and hotels and flight information and things that have relevance to the mobile scenario. So I'll give you some, some examples here and I'm going to Essentially, what I'm going to do in this, and this is an emulator running the exact software that I'm going to, that I have in my, my iPhone, is I'm going to be simulating on the emulator, touching it, talking to my phone, and having it respond. So that's the idea. Is the Brad Pitt movie still playing? Okay, so we created a, what we call a conversational interface that, that reflects what, what you said. It's almost like an IM session where you're, you're talking to a machine and, and having it understand what you're doing. It then goes out to the web, or it actually determines what it is you're trying to do, which services on the internet can help you do it, and we dynamically orchestrate that live to come back with hopefully what's a good answer. So. Here's, here's the movie. We've, we've dynamically uh, checked reviews from a service called Rotten Tomatoes. We have by location shown you the theaters where this is playing. Uh, we've also plugged in the one, what we call one-click commerce where you can immediately buy a ticket. All of that which is connected and, and dynamically orchestrated. Other use cases that are relevant in the mobile world um, Find direct flights from San Jose to Chicago. So again, Siri understood what it is you're trying to do, goes and, and dynamically says, well, there's a service called Flight Stats, which has good flight information, and we'll, let's dynamically mash that up with Google Maps, and we'll instantly uh, mash those up in the interface and give you a good answer to the question.
find fancy French restaurants in San Francisco for tomorrow night? <laughs> so there's some inference there on what fancy means, for example. I think that's the... Uh, Siri is based on understanding domains well, and that will be the success or failure of the company. Um, this is, I, of course, I have a, a script here of things I want to cover, but the key aspect of this is that we need to have a high degree of, of, of competence in these areas. Currently, we have, within the areas that I showed you, uh, we have around a, over 90% success rate at answering basic questions or handling basic tasks within the domains that we handle. I'll give you some more examples here. So again, the metaphor is that Siri is your, your assistant. Um, one of the really interesting aspects about assistantness and the internet is that you can ask Siri to do things directly for you. So I can, it can take actions on your behalf. Book Zabibo at 9 p.m. I think most people will know the Italian restaurant Zabibo in Palo Alto. So it's, it's recognized that Zabibo actually is a restaurant. There are somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 million businesses in the U.S. Every word in the, in the English language has a business name. Uh, there's a whole lot of intelligence behind disambiguating what it is we're talking about. Asking a service. So looking at this example, we took uh, audio capture, turned it into a WAV file, sent it to a speech partner who, who we partner with called Blingo who sends us back the words, which we then take into the Siri brain and, and understand what it is that somebody's trying to do, reason about what kind of services can help them do it, go in and do a live call to those services to figure out, for, in this case, is there availability tonight at Zabibo at 9 o'clock? Um, and and it's, it's also uh, conversational. So I can say, it, it remembers what I'm trying to do, in other words. I can say, if you, if you watch, for example, the, the party size, for three people. So now it's gone and again, checked with OpenTable and are there tables for three available and, and gone ahead and make that known that that's the right adjustment to make. So we do that in, in many different cases and that's a part of the art of understanding conversational interfaces. So also on the assistant side, we're going to be adding administrative things like, remind me to call mom on Saturday morning. So it understands, for example, that that's, there's an alert to be created there. So it's going to send me an email on Saturday morning at 7 a.m., and I can certainly adjust those times and so on. Um, but it's, it's useful, we believe. Will it rain in Miami the day after tomorrow? So it also takes context into consideration, which is also a very hard thing to do. So it knows when the day after tomorrow is. It knows that Miami is a, a place. Uh, and even in the weather, we're starting to do actually very specific question and answering. As you can see in this case, it knew exactly what I was trying to do, and it, as it does in many things. Uh, other areas are, are harder to do this in, but we're, we're starting to play around with, with doing that. Um, the last thing I'll show you is uh, how we plug into when we know that there's questions. We know that there's things we know, and we know that there's things we don't know. So I can ask, we can answer several hundred million questions through services like Will from Alpha and True Knowledge and some of the Encarta services from Microsoft and so on. So I can say, how old is Barack Obama? <laughs> so we knew, Siri figured out who might be able to answer a question like that and delegated that to that service. Uh, but if I ask it a question about something that we know it doesn't know. How old is Joe Mama? Gamama? So we didn't get an answer to that question, so we delegated that to a search engine. So this, this automatically failed over to, in this case, um, Microsoft Bing, and, and just said, great, I don't know, but here's, here's what, what Bing says about it. Uh, the last thing I'm going to show you here is series partners. 
you can see that this, this we've integrated a number of, of web services with probably less than 10% of our, our resources. So it's, uh, we've, we've created a platform that makes it very easy to add new things. And of course, our best guess here is to try to figure out how to launch a new paradigm like this. What are the use cases that make sense? What is the business and the economic side of this, which we're going to talk more about today? Um, and, and how do you launch this into a market in a way that doesn't require a lot of trust and a lot of personal data in the early stage? But of course, ultimately the vision here is that in five years, you're going to have this completely integrated. It's going to know your itineraries and it's going to be managing your calendar and it's going to be helping you manage your social life. And it's going to be doing a lot of things that takes advantage of the services that are out there that do these things and that make it very seamless and very personal. Uh, the APIs to do this are there today. Uh, there, are, there is almost nothing that, that we don't that we would like to do in our roadmap that doesn't have an API and a willing partner. So we're excited about that. And of course, for the technologists in the crowd, just a few slides on, I think that people will appreciate how hard this is to do and to scale this. There's been a lot of work uh, put in this. But you know, the essence is that the component technologies themselves, as you know, are very, very difficult. Uh, seamlessly integrating them and scaling it is, is even harder. So this is, this is not as simple as taking state of the art and speech recognition, combining it with some uh, natural language engine, uh, plug in, and then plugging it into a web service API. There's a whole lot involved with that uh, that, that Adam and, and others have been working on for uh, close to a few decades at this point. Um, so it's hard to do, but we're excited that it's getting close. and we have to be careful about how the expectations that we create about what Siri will be able to do for you because it's, it's all about being useful. It's not about being perfect. And what I can promise people is that it will be easy to use. I can promise you that it will come up and, and do some silly things and say some silly things, but not most of the time. It's going to be pretty useful. It's pretty knowledgeable in the areas uh, that we focus on. and. Uh, in terms of how it plays with all, uh, alternatives, we're pretty confident that there isn't anything quite like this. Just the last couple of things, big questions. Why is it interesting now? There's a set of, of elements that are going on technically and in the market that make this a good time to launch. I'm not going to go too much into the details because I think I'm running out of time at this point. But these are the key elements. It isn't a search engine, so it's not as simple as taking words, sticking it into a search engine. You really need to understand dialogue and how, how, to, how to handle different types of things. And I think a lot of you have, have been in, in some form of uh, working on issues like this um, in the past. So that's just a little sampling of some of the challenges that, that it takes to take on a, a challenge like this. I think that's about it, and I'm going to see the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. It's great. I wish I had the personal assistant too from work. You know, if you're an e-commerce merchant and if you have, you know, you would be asking why do you, over 50% of the site visitors are abandoning the cart to my personal life saying, okay, what should I be cooking tonight and give me all the recipes to um, tell me my horoscope, what's my lucky color today. So I can't wait to have that on my iPhone. Um, now I would like to introduce our moderator tonight, Sven Strohband. He is, as you can see on this um, uh, program sheet, he is a partner at MVD, MDV, I'm sorry. And he specializes in clean tech and IT. As you can see on this, he was the, uh, the lead engineer for the Stanford racing team and his robot actually drove 132 miles. And now it's a one a race, and it's at the Smithsonian at the moment. He is an avid cyclist himself, so if you, can't, if you want to have a meeting with him, and if he's not in his office, the best place to find him is the old La Onda Road. So, well, here is Ven.
close this down. So first of all, uh, thanks to, to, to everyone for coming. Um, I think we have a great panel tonight, and we have a great panel and not quite that much time, so I'm not going to, to, to make a long speech here. Um, actually, speaking a little bit with the, with the panelists, uh, we thought it might have been a better panel if instead of just the panelists, we would have, in addition, a Twitter bot that we could ask questions to who would then respond. We would have a lifetime test of, uh, of AI here. But um, when, I, when I got asked if I could, uh, uh, could do this event, uh, I was thinking a little bit of what I've gotten myself into here because uh, AI is really kind of an ill-defined term. It means an awful lot of different things to an awful lot of different people. Um, yet in the media all of a sudden, and also in the investment community, there's kind of a resurgence of interest in AI topics, be those topics robotics, be those topics machine learning, be those topics um, personal assistance. So there's a couple of trends that are behind that. So in, in robotics, uh, when you take a look at uh, UAVs, for example, five years ago, there was basically no UAVs in, in general use. Now there's tens of thousands of UAVs uh, in, in, in general use. If you take a look at home appliances, even a, a Roomba is now a perfectly affordable device. So there's a couple of things that have happened. Technologies have become sufficiently reliable to be used in robotics, in actual application, as actual products, not as research things. And also, they have become cheap enough to actually be possible to, to deploy in a mass market. The same goes for, for machine learning in the valley. The, the, um, the colloquialism is, you know, the, the petabyte is a new terabyte. And so there's sufficient data now to do interesting mining upon it. And whereas we used to have BI before, by now, machine learning is in the heart of the operation of a lot of companies. It is not an exercise that I do offline and I get a result a week later, and then I change the strategy of my company according to it. When you do, for example, ad serving, if you run a quant fund for that matter, you need that information right then, right there. So it has become part of the operational DNA of uh, quite a few, few companies. And there's a whole bunch of other um, things that are bubbling up here in, in, in the valley that make AI an interesting topic. Those are just two of those, those areas I, I wanted to, to touch on. But what I really would like to do in the interest of time is I would love to, to invite the panel up here. Um, we have a great panel, and that panel speaks to the variants AI has. We have people from the robotics field, we have people from machine learning, we have people who are focused on neural nets and biological systems. So I think this is going to be a rather, rather interesting panel here. So maybe I, um, we, I, I would like to, to, to ask the, the panel members to just briefly in two minutes introduce yourself and introduce the, the company. Um, maybe we'll start um, uh, with you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Sven, and, and thanks for, uh, uh, for convening this really engaging panel. I'm just as interested to hear what all these guys have to say as, as to speak myself. Uh, our group is a, a company called Evolved Machines, which seems very apt for the sub subject matter tonight. Um, I gave a, a talk at uh, Xerox Park a little while ago that had a uh, title of it was The Next Paradigm in Artificial Intelligence. And what it reminds me is that um, what Doug and his company are doing is really what is widely known classically as artificial intelligence. And for starters, grappling with the field if you're not familiar with it, you have to understand that what was begun as artificial intelligence 50 plus years ago uh, inspired by the desire to somehow take inspiration from the workings of the brain to build machines and eventually intelligent machines. That's become a very highly developed, very mature field with a lot of sophisticated, very success, successful applications, one of which you just saw now. Uh, it's very much a logic system applied to problems. The brain doesn't work that way at all. Computers do, and that's why AI started I its initiation quickly uh, uh, from talking about uh, modeling the brain, it, it quickly became the development of logic systems to solve problems because computer science was just 
uh, was just being born in the 40s, and then that led to AI in the 50s, and the computing paradigm, the logic paradigm was natural. In fact, if you've learned about the way brains work, if any of you have, have studied that problem, you know that the circuits in the brain are not logic circuits. So our company, uh, if you go to the website, you'll see more than I can tell you tonight. Our company is built on the reverse engineering of brain circuits to solve very different problems, really, than the classic artificial intelligence problems of, of which we just saw a beautiful example. Okay, Th thank you. Um, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Like, it's Steve. This is like that game where you run out of words at some point. I have to make sure I say the right thing. Um, so I'm Steve Cousins. I'm uh, the CEO of a company called Willow Garage. The garage is an homage to all the startups in Silicon Valley that have started in garages. Um, and we're about a two and a half years old company. For the last two years, we've been working on what we call a personal robot. We're a research and development company, and we're delivering open source robotic platforms. The personal robot, you can look at our website, you can see lots of videos of the robot. It's basically a um, human scale robot that can navigate in, in ADA compliant environments. It rolls around um, and uh, is designed to basically be helpful around. So um, you talked about uh, a, a virtual personal assistant. We're producing the promise of a real personal assistant. Um, and um, we're doing it with open source software because we think we're a little ways away from fully autonomous systems. Um, I wanted to say two things uh, about this panel. One thing is um, the rise of the machines is a terrible name. Um, <laughs> there's nothing, we had a picture of our robot on the front page of the New York Times. I was very excited about that. But the title underneath it, the caption, we didn't get to write. It said, um, you know, Matt, sir, said, servant now, master later. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is not what we're going for. Well, wasn't that the uh, last iteration of dog system? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That, that also makes me nervous. Um, the, the other thing uh, is that when we talk about AI, and I, I spent some time in the uh, AI group at Stanford when I was doing my PhD, um, but when we talk about AI, we usually think, oh, it's got to be all or nothing. We've got to figure out how to get a completely intelligent machine. And you know these robots, as much as I don't want to say rise of the machines, they are telepathic, which just means they have 802.11 built in, and they can access the Internet right now, which means they can access Mechanical Turk right now, which means they can ask for help at any point that they want to. And that means that we don't have to do completely autonomous, and we don't have to do completely teleoperated, but there's a really interesting space in between that we're exploring and, and uh, that I think is interesting. George? By the way, full, full disclosure, I, I think I, I do need to give, uh, actually, um, Rocket Fuel is one of our portfolio companies. So, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, but I got on the panel before he did, so it's okay. <laughs> That's um, true. <laughs> our portfolio companies uh, are more important. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it was no undue influence on my part to get spent as the moderator. Um, so, I uh, was a student here at Stanford, along with Steve, actually, uh, in the early and mid-90s, um, more accustomed to being on that side of the table than uh, up here. Um, and uh, so I'm CEO of uh, Rocket Fuel Incorporated. Um, Sven was mentioning that if you're into AI, um, you know, there's a couple of industries that very directly reward uh, smarts uh, in the sort of uh, short to medium term, which is sort of quantitative finance and then online advertising, which really has a lot of an analogs to quantitative finance. And, uh, you know, what with all the hijinks in New York and Wall Street, we figured we'd, we'd better look at online advertising. Um, so, um, and I think we can all agree. I mean, the state of online advertising for display ads, banner ads, it's, it's, it's pretty grim. You know, you log in, you see these crappy, uh, flabby weight loss ads, uh, acai berries, colon cleanse. I mean, so, and the reason that you're seeing all these things is because um, uh, there's not enough AI in display advertising. Um, it's because uh, the people who are buying and selling online ad inventory uh, don't yet know well enough how to buy, you know, just the right inventory for a really solid, you know, campaign for the Microsoft Zune service or a really solid campaign for, you know, Nike shoes. So you're seeing all this other stuff out there. Um, so uh, we believe that uh, with um, some technology that, uh, that you can build response models so, and try to predict ahead of time who's likely to respond to what ad um, and then uh, have an ad stream policy and uh, an inventory acquisition policy that's based on that. Uh, you know, for advertisers, you can deliver great results. Uh, for web publishers, you can pay out better you know, for the ad space that they have in their sites. And users can stop seeing all these crappy ads all the time. Um, so as a, as a company, we're about one and a half years old, about 25 people uh, located uh, up the streets in Revit Shores and funded by uh, top tier venture capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> Rob. 
Okay, um, I, I actually like the title Rise of the Machines myself, but uh, I think our, our corporate uh, vision is to uh, ingratiate ourselves with our future robotic overlords, so I thought no one else <laughs> but Silicon Valley can do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, so good luck, you guys. We'll, uh, we'll be seeing you around. Um, but seriously, so vitamin D is, I'm chief product officer, and we develop object recognition in uh, video for security and monitoring applications. And our technology is based on a technology, we're a spinoff from Palm, and the, uh, you, some of you may know that the founder of Palm founded a company called Numenta, who's developed a theory of how the brain actually works and developed some algorithms and a platform for that. And we founded a company uh, separate from Numenta that builds applications on top of that platform. Uh, so that's, that's what vitamin D does. We're eight people uh, over here in Menlo Park. Great. So w one thing I, I, I would uh, love to do is to, to ask each one of you um, what the state of the art in your field is and how you are pushing it further along. So in whatever respected field it is, uh, be it on the robotic side, be it on the vision side, um, and what commercial application does that enable? So um, maybe I'll start with you, Doc. Well, we have uh, a large number of technologies that, that we blend. I think that's sort of the secret sauce of what, what we're developing is that it combines a set of things that are required uh, to have a simple interaction with a machine. And uh, I mentioned a bit earlier the enablers that, that the state of the art requires all of them to be in good enough shape, otherwise the whole thing doesn't work. So uh, speech recognition is getting good enough, as I mentioned. Uh, natural language understanding within restricted domains. So uh, understanding what you know and what to do with it and uh, pushing that up into the in, in our case, 90 plus percent uh, understanding of, of a variety of different types of uh, questions and answers within the things that we claim to be good at. Um, and then, of course, the state of the art in terms of utilizing this web of data that is now becoming more and more proliferated through APIs in the back end. And there's an enormous amount of data out there that is structured and is ready to be utilized in interesting new ways. So I think Tim Berners-Lee will tell you all about it. Uh, he's been talking for the last few years about this. Uh, we want to apply state of the art across the technologies I mentioned to create an experience that is finally interesting. Is there a metric that would signify good enough for consumer adoption? Because I would imagine one of the risks in, in your business is consumer adoption. Right. So I'll, answer, I'll give you the answer to that question about Christmas time. Uh, All right. Since we're launching in two months. But uh, what, one of the key metrics we measure is something called uh, in-domain success rate. So when we say we know movies and we ask the users to ask questions about movies, uh, how well do we respond to those questions? So ac as asking about movies and actor names and, and is there, you know, when is the next matinee and... Uh, when is the matinee start and, and there's, a, there's a pretty infinite number of things that, that people can ask in various domains and for us being good at responding to those is the metric, one of the key metrics that we use. Of course, okay. performance and speed and so on is important as well. But. Paul? So again, you'll, you'll gather that what we understand is artificial intelligence, the classic AI, uh, is very different from what we're developing. Uh, Better paradigm for us, uh, the place that we start is the recognition of objects in complex environments, both in visual object recognition and in olfactory, uh, being able to build a device that can smell something. Now, both of them are, are DARPA funded for us. Both of them are very neural. Um, and you might, uh, you might consider that it's a very simple thing to recognize an object. You can certainly do it effortlessly. It's been a holy grail of machine learning uh, for 50 years. Um, and the old methods, classical artificial intelligence, even, even neural networks, haven't worked. The example that I'll give you is, however, in olfaction, which would seem to be even simpler. Um, the, 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 the state of the art, to answer your question, Sven, is to recognize, based on a sensor system that reacts to an odorant, to recognize and identify an odorant, maybe across a variety of concentrations. And, and simple algorithm systems can do that if you have a good sensor. What they can't do is something that's 
pivotal to survival if you depend on olfaction, and that's to recognize, you know, the smell of a predator and the presence of the forest where there's all sorts of other smells all around you that are stronger. So how to recognize things in the presence of background. That's what neural systems do. That's what reverse engineering neural systems to build machines leads you to be able to do. And that's the distinction between what has been possible and what needs to be. Can possible. you detect in the predator thing the presence of venture capitalists? <laughs> <laughs> Just curious. <laughs> I could riff in all kinds of Th different ways. That wasn't very kind, but uh, <laughs> I, I hope you get along with your board. <laughs> um, Steve. You'll send a video of this, too. So Wonderful. the... Uh, so this, the state of the art in robotics, I guess, is maybe best summed up by, uh, uh, I went to Japan and I wanted to get a sense of, you know, I understand the Japanese do a lot of robotics and I want to understand the state of the, of the market there. And, and we went to a lab and this, they had a bunch of the best walking robots with two arms and, you know, everything, um, and they're hanging there, right, because they don't, they don't when they're turned off, they're going to fall down. And I said, can we get a demo of that robot? And the answer was really interesting. He said, if I had two hours and two PhDs, I could get it running for you. Um, so robotics is, at least at the sophisticated robot, the robot that we're building is about on, is on the same order of magnitude number of parts as a car and is a complicated device. If you want to program, if you want to build and program a robot, you need to be a mechanical engineer, you need to be a electrical engineer, you need to be a computer scientist, and you need to know some AI to get all that stuff working. As a result, the graduate students in the field have to spend an enormous amount of time mastering enough of all of those fields that they can put something together so that they can then make some advance. And even the graduate students that I run into, they tend to specialize because you have to. So they're either perception people or they're manipulation people and or, you know, controls people or, or hardware people or whatever. And, and with that kind of specialization, you end up having to have a really big team to get stuff done. So what we're doing to address that is we're creating a hardware platform that's robust um, that addresses the number one problem that the researchers in robotics lab tell us, which is my robot's always broken. So we take all the parts in the robot, we put it through 11 million cycles, so basically two years of continuous operation, and make sure that it's not going to break um, when it bumps into a table or in all the situations that we can think of. I'm sure it'll still break, but it's, it's not going to break in one of the many, many ways that we tested it. Um, and then we put, we put in, by the way, we put in a hot box. So we put it outside in the um, container in our parking lot with space heaters and humidifiers and simulated Pittsburgh in the summer mm -hmm. and then, <laughs> <laughs> then brought it out into California weather. That's just making it mad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so the other thing we're doing is we're doing open source software. Um, and open source software means that um, we have this big integrated system that people can contribute to and by making it open source under BSD or Apache 2.0 license, anyone in the world can make a business off of that. So we're saying we're going to make impact first and we'll make money as a second priority, impact being a more important priority. That allows us to get graduate students from lots of different institutions interested and willing to contribute. That allows us to accelerate the time until we can actually have a lot of these robots out there and fundamentally address that problem of instead of waiting for a good enough setup um, or having graduate students spend hours and hours and hours and years actually learning all the different pieces, they can start with a system that works and then start tweaking the parts that is where they're going to specialize. And, and that, I think, is going to make a big difference. Great. George? So, um, state of the art. So, there's, uh, there's sort of academic state of the art and then, um, you know, industry state of the art, I guess. Um, one of the reasons I ended up just doing practical stuff was I realized uh, uh, much to the chagrin of my advisor in the fifth row uh, <laughs> during my <laughs> PhD here, that um, you know, the, the state of the art in industry was just so far um, uh, lagging behind the state of the art in academia um, that uh, it just seemed like somebody ought to get out there and just try to get these guys uh, caught up. So uh, in, uh, in ad serving, uh, for, for display ads, I guess, uh, you know, an ad server is basically a robot situated in this um, uh, in digital world, right? It's, uh, uh, you know, as an analog to, uh, you know, physical robot getting bumped is, uh, uh, you know, the ad server, for example, experiencing a spike in traffic from some publisher that before had very little traffic and all of a sudden that throws the network operating characteristics out of whack and just as a physical robot would then have to balance by taking some sort of corrective action. So the, you know, the ad server has to take some corrective action by adjusting the ad serving policy and um, rates of delivery and such. Um, but the, so the, the core uh, technologies end up being, um, you know, within AI, it's, it's about machine learning 
And uh, a lot of the kind of adaptive control that I guess uh, people used to do in robotics, um, uh, dealing with the lag, for example, between sensing the world and being able to react to it, uh, you end up with similar um, sorts of problems. Uh, so there's machine learning problems uh, given uh, a campaign for, you know, again, let's say I'm trying to sell Nike shoes. Um, you know, ads online might get a click-through rate of one in a thousand, and then maybe one in a hundred to one in a thousand people will then actually convert and buy the darn shoes after that. So um, it's a very weak signal that you're trying to extrapolate from. And I guess the, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, academic uh, results that are kind of off the shelf uh, for machine learning. Um, but in these regimes of kind of, you know, ultra weak and ultra rare signal, um, you know, there's a lot of work that you have to do actually to kind of extend state of the art in these regimes to kind of smooth data um, across a lot of dimensions. So it ends up being, I guess, uh, you know, there's, there's some sort of uh, uh, fun academic aspects to it. And there's a lot of just kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, getting your hands dirty and kind of learning the street smarts and tricks um, of uh, heuristic approaches to, to making things work. Rob? So I'd describe the state of the art in recognizing people in videos as in a constrained environment where you have a technician, similar to what Steve was suggesting, you have a technician spend several hours per camera getting everything configured, telling the computer what the ground plane is and what the geometry is of your system, and nothing strange happens and you're in control of your environment totally, it actually works pretty well. Um, and uh, if something happens, if a, if a uh, light starts to flicker or if a bird puts a nest in a tree and birds start flying around, you have to have the technicians come back and, and re-fix things. And, uh, and so, so we refer to this as being brittle. Uh, you, it, that's a, you know, to be honest, it does actually can get it to work um, uh, pretty, pretty reasonably well. But um, uh, in order to make a robust system, we feel this next generation of intelligent computing will make it easier to... to have people just uh, uh, work out of the box and work in much more robust environments. Great, thanks. So I, I got handed a, uh, a note reminding me that I should remind the audience about the yellow cards. So I think the policy is they need to pass to the VLAB volunteer at the end of the aisle. So I have relayed that message now. Um, uh, an, another question I, I wanted to ask is, um, since this is a, a panel about the commercialization of, of AI, so who are your customers and what's the value proposition for, for your customers, for your respective companies? So who buys your product or service and what does that enable for them? So let's start with, with you, Doug. Uh, I'll keep it quick. Um, our, ours is a consumer-oriented uh, product that we hope lots of people will find useful. So the end user is the, uh, is the core customer. The uh, demographic we're targeting is, is roughly analogous to uh, the iPhone demographic in terms of the mobile. Um, the, the business model for Siri is about the economics of click reduction, which is where AI comes in for us, really understanding what somebody's trying to do and getting them quickly to it uh, in the form of transactions. So, a lot of the use cases that we have relate to finding something around you, uh, finding what's going on around here and finding events and there's tickets related to those events in, in many cases or there's tickets to the movie that you want to see and there's uh, services like OpenTable to get the table at the restaurant that you're trying to find. So there's a direct relationship economically between the amount of clicks and pain that a user goes through and the number of people that go through it and of course there's uh, fantastic economics related to uh, making efficiencies in, in, that, in that front. So uh, just to, to, to clarify from a, for, for, for the understanding here, um, so that means um, this is a transactional based um, model where you take a cut of the transaction? Yeah, so that, that's a piece, piece of okay. the model. That's, that's one element of it and we believe one of the primary elements of it, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, Paul? So I'll give two, uh, two brief examples that uh, stick with artificial olfaction rather than uh, robot vision, which Rob will probably touch on at the end. Uh, the country has uh, a law that's been passed that requires every shipping container coming into the country to be inspected for bombs and drugs and contraband and all sorts of other things. The Department of Homeland Security can't do it. There's 200 million containers in the world. They all come in or out of the United States at some point. Screening them with a, with a person or a dog uh, is not, not practical. One of the devices that we're working on is a container monitor, something to smell what's in the container 24 hours a day in the dark as it's crossing the Pacific, uh, something that the Department of Homeland Security very much wants to and is legally obliged to uh, try to make happen. Another example in the same space, 
gets us more into robotics. We're working with uh, the firm iRobot. They make the Roombas, I think Sven alluded to. Um, they also have uh, robots that go with the Army into threat environments and try to find and defuse bombs, uh, for example. However, these aren't autonomous. They're guided by joystick and the soldiers controlling them with a heads-up display and another soldier standing behind them with a rifle to protect them. Very expensive operating mode. What they would like, what the Army, I'm sure, would like is to have robots that could be dropped into a threat environment with a chemical sensor on board, with a chemical sensor motor, an olfactive motor intelligence to find the bomb by itself. So those are two examples at the extremes in, uh, in that space. Thank you. Steve? So I mentioned that we're a research company and we're shooting a little bit further out. And so um, right now my customers are the researchers who are going to use this as a platform to move forward. I think that the interesting question that, that we grapple with all the time inside is if you have a general purpose robot that can move around in a human environment and can do things like people can do, what is the best use of it and, and what's the price point and what are the capabilities that are really required? The first prototype has two arms. Does the final prototype have to have one arm or three arms or two arms or does it need a flip down tray? Does it need an LCD panel? We don't know exactly. Um, and so I'm actually really interested to turn that back on the audience to think about if you have a platform like this, where, what would make sense? And if there's any entrepreneurs out here who say, I, I know just what we could do with that thing, I'd love to hear from you because that's the next phase for us is starting to seriously explore applications and understand um, whether it's going to be serving the elderly or whether it's going to be working in you know, factory floors or something else. So you, you also have an interesting seating model, it seems, where you, you kind of um, provide some of the robots to selected institutions at yes. basically zero cost and so you're trying to, to, to really seed the, the innovation on yeah, your we're platform. We're giving away 10 robots at the end, around the end of this year to top research universities to just get, get things going. George? Interestingly, uh, Steve's question to the audience around uh, what would be cool applications of robots, it's what drove me away from robotics because uh, <laughs> all of a sudden we realized all we would ever talk about, talk about was, uh, you know, someday we're going to send a robot to Mars. And uh, of course that happened, but uh, I had uh, <laughs> bailed out of it long, long before. Um, so um, our customers, uh, I guess we're probably a more straightforward business. Uh, we sell to uh, major advertising agencies, uh, to account teams that are looking to run ads for, I, I think I mentioned, uh, Nike, we've got Microsoft uh, that we've run ads for, Adobe, Nintendo, Panasonic, um, and a bunch of others including Fashion, Lord & Taylor, etc. So um, uh, it's, uh, in this case we're kind of entering an existing market, just one that, um, uh, you know, it's got too many humans in it. Um, <laughs> so uh, we feel like uh, there's an advantage to replacing um, uh, the, the, the labor um, and the kind of the grunt work of, you know, extracting data from some campaign, pivoting it around in Excel, looking for a variable or two that might yield better performance if only we excluded, uh, you know, Florida from the campaign. Would that help? But what, if, what about uh, only running the, the you know, wide banner but not the long one? So there's no real reason for people to, to do that. And so that's sort of the, the pitch that we give to the ad agencies for their clients is to say, um, we'll run it for you. And then the value prop is just that uh, we'll, we'll do a better job. So um, the, uh, for the most part, online campaigns are measured um, in a few ways, um, either some sort of brand uh, awareness uh, kind of lift or some sort of direct response kind of lift. And so most advertisers look to us to deliver uh, new customers or sales to them at a, at a lower cost uh, than you know, other sort of human-powered ad networks out there. Rob? So uh, the short answer is small businesses, schools and institutions, small institutions, and consumer, residential, do-it-yourself customers who, as I was describing the technology, because it requires this expert, uh, experts to come in and handhold and spend all this time supporting your product, it's very expensive and the market today is limited to companies with very valuable assets who are willing to throw a lot of money at it. So our value proposition is if we provide the uh, equivalent or better functionality actually than the professional enterprise grade systems at a fundamentally uh, fraction of the cost, then we can, expand, we can expand the market. In fact, one of the customers we spoke to was uh, Stanford Security. They said they have a, uh, so there's a pool by, a, by some dorm back here. They said students keep jumping into, uh, obviously not the business school students, but you know those immature undergrads keep jumping into this pool and they have literally said they've been asked to have a, they want to have a security monitor this pool so people don't jump in it and if you just had a camera there they could detect it then that would be a lot, uh, you know, a simpler solution for them. Great. I, I have a bunch of questions from the audience, and instead of me asking the questions, I think it's probably more interesting to, to, to hear what, what, what you guys want to hear. So um, this, is a, this is a good one, and um, 
This is so uh, vitamin D via Nomenta and evolved machines both, both claim inspiration in neural mechanisms. So what is the same, what is different between you guys? Uh, <laughs> see, um, well, um, I, I think the, phil the phil philosophy is the same. Uh, if, if you ask one is, what has changed about AI, I think one of the fundamental changes is that uh, we've abandoned the idea that, uh, that uh, the intelligence is a black box. And, it's, uh, and that, that rules-based systems, uh, it, we don't care how you get the answers. If you just apply enough rules and throw enough horsepower and, and computing power at it, you can solve the problem. So I think what's similar is the, the philosophy that uh, you really need to understand what is going on in the neocortex, what are the actual uh, algorithms and, and properties. And from my perspective, I, I, I don't know enough, I'll, I'll let uh, um, uh, Paul respond, but uh, um, I, I would maybe articulate as we, uh, the Numenta model is based on uh, more of the software, more of the algorithms as opposed to the actual uh, neurological structure. I don't know if you'd call that fair or not. Uh, so it's a good comparison question. I often get asked, after I've, someone has learned about our group and what we're doing and the technology we're developing, if I know Jeff Hawkins and, and do, do we know each other, and their technology as ours is very much inspired by the brain and its structure. I would say what's different is that we uh, believe in reverse engineering and building um, a simulated brain circuits and using those just like the brain of animals do to solve sensory problems of the kinds that I mentioned. Um, so it's very, very much more going close to the metal and uh, constructing circuitry. Whereas I, th I think it's fair to say that Numenta is inspired by a, a distillation of the circuitry uh, to make an algorithm system that uh, captures some of its function and then uh, develops applications. So this is a question for, for, for Doug which is, uh, is there a high learning threshold for the SRI uh, series speech recognition module? How long does it take? What are the challenges with difficult voices and, and accents? And I think I'm going to generalize that a, l a little bit and ask then afterwards each one of you what kind of the specific challenges are that you are currently working on. So the biggest challenge we have with uh, the speech we use for Siri is getting somebody to put their mouth close, close enough to the microphone. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, there, there's no training at all with, with our system, actually. Siri isn't in the speech recognition business. We partner with people that we think are the state of the art, and there's, there's very few integration points there. there there's, a, there's a few uh, related to mobile and contacts and so on, but generally speaking, um, our partner, uh, Lingo, uh, uses IBM's speech engine uh, and does not require training to, to get pretty good results. If you speak clear, you can actually do this. You can use Siri in a crowded bar if you time it right so that there isn't too much uh, and it's, it's not that hard it's actually pretty impressive where, where speech has evolved to and I've watched other systems uh, get much better even in the last year so the answer is no, no training required at this point and of course if that proves to be a, a, uh, a process that, that improves the product going forward we'll, we'll certainly consider it but Actually, the, there was one question that was kind of related to it, uh, also about Siri, which is uh, how many domains can be added and what's involved with that and to what level of domains does that scale? Right. Uh, that's a good question. Um, not that the other one wasn't, but that's a particularly <laughs> good question. Um, we feel very confident that Siri can scale to a large number of domains. Um, we, we've, we've analyzed uh, the the success rates of, of, of any sort of crosstalk as it pertains to the ones that we've done. And there's a long way to go, we feel, in how far you can take this out, especially because the things that we'll be focusing on in the near term relate to task orientation and what it is that people generally are trying to do within the areas that we focus on. So uh, we're, we're, we're confident that the, that, that the science scales. Uh, we're going to take it one step at a time. And the answer to the question of how long does it take and what does it take is the, uh, the way we define a domain is a set of services that combine in a logical formation to a value proposition. So restaurants, for example, you can ask questions about that require location and reviews and booking and food types and menus uh, and so on. That's one domain and they all vary depending on what it is you're doing. So one of the other ones would be local businesses 
that's a hard domain because you have uh, much, much more aggressive uh, numbers and scale to deal with when you're talking about 15 to 20 million business names. Uh, how do you know that something is a business name versus a, a movie versus, um, you know, you can go on and on in that. But um, we're, we're confident that so far we've, we've gone from one domain to about eight domains and we haven't had very many uh, what we call ambiguity issues. And uh, the process takes for us anywhere from hours to a few weeks on the more complex type. So I showed you, for example, uh, the delegation of, uh, of questions to a question and answering type of service um, that Adam did, who's sitting here um, over a weekend, actually a short weekend, to plug in uh, several question and answer services and uh, derive that there's a question being asked here and so on. So uh, that's one of the key aspects to this is that we've spent a lot of time figuring out how to combine these technologies in a platform that allows you to do it in a very quick and uh, commercially viable way. And not only that, but the other big issue here is that you don't need to be a linguist or an ontologist or an AI expert to do this. If you know Java, uh, you can pretty much uh, program Siri. So that's one of the other big elements is normalizing across a, a pretty complex set of technologies, uh, a platform that allows you to do it quickly and easily. Paul, what are the, the greatest challenges right now? Getting enough Your speaking field. time to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Other than speaking time. Yeah, that's... <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> um, so there was a question back there uh, that, that Doug, Doug touched on and uh, that had to do with learning and to what extent learning is uh, involved in uh, our artificial intelligence technology. Uh, in our case, it's quite opposite to the system where no learning at all is needed. Uh, you know, it's got pre-built knowledge. We, we grow our simulated brain circuitry by exposing the simulated circuit as it's growing to millions of time steps of sensory information, just like a baby grows its brain as it's looking at the world from its first uh, weeks after birth. Uh, so our systems, w we believe that neural circuits are all about the wiring of them, and that wiring is all about uh, changes in wiring during exposure to the sensory environment that one is embedded in. And so our neural machines, very different from the other paradigms of AI, are all about the self-organization of wiring, and that's all about learning. That's all about tremendous amount of sensory experience. Once the sensory experience has been has been had and the wiring has been done, of course, we can manufacture a million copies of that system, all of which have had the same experience and all of which can recognize objects uh, in the world. But it's very much in the beginning about learning. Steve? I would say um, the biggest challenges we face in robotics are perception, r robot perception, how it perceives the world, and manipulation and grasping, how you actually deal with objects in the world. Um, perception is hard because cameras are so terrible compared to the human eye. Um, so you get, you know, the human eye is very good at, very sensitive um, and able to, like when I look around the room, I can um, detect colors really easily. And a lot of times I'm shocked when I look through the camera's eye view of what the robot's seeing. Think, why can't it see that, right? It's just the cameras just simply aren't as good as, as uh, we'd like them to be. Um, and dealing with perception is also difficult because you know, we have what half of our brain is used to perceive the world. And for the robot, if you want to do that, you basically end up having to use all the core processors on board to just do basic perception, just like label this environment. You know, there's a person, there's a person that I know, there's another person and so forth. Um, the other problem, the manipulation problem is hard because even though you think um, I'm just moving around in 3D space, when you're moving a robot arm, you're actually moving all the de degrees, all the different motors on that robot arm and trying to do that in some coherent way. And so getting from here to under here is easy for me, right? I just do that. For the robot, you've got to be thinking about, well, which joint do I move where and, and how am I going to avoid that? I think that's a problem that's going to be solved. But the brute force approaches are basically exponential in the number of motors in the arm. So with seven degrees of freedom, you, you basically are reduced to doing sampling based planning, and that makes it a very challenging problem uh, computationally. And so you get 
very interesting movements like the robot will start here and just wants to move this over to here and it'll you know, do it around like that <laughs> back because that was the plan that it came up with. And, and we can do a smoother plan, but it takes longer. So would you rather have it wait for 20 seconds and then make a smooth move or do you want to start right away and do something goofy? Um, we, we kind of trade off uh, depending where we are. Um, so, so those are the things that, that computationally take the most time. I think the other thing I mentioned earlier about robotics being across so many fields, so one of the biggest challenges uh, that we have as a company is dealing with different cultures. We have research culture in the building, we have development culture in the building, we have manufacturing culture in the building, and there's a huge gap between manufacturing and research. And it's just, you know, do you come in at 7 a.m. or do you come in at 11 a.m., for starters? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. George? Um, curious, uh, raise your hand if you've seen the Shaky the Robot video. Oh man, okay, so if the rest of you have the gumption to come tonight, you should see that. Um, so, because uh, I was going to answer from the, uh, what, what's tricky for us is actually, um, uh, you know, changes in, in the environment. Uh, again, if you think of an ad server as a robot that lives within this digital world, uh, what's tricky is sort of changes uh, that happen in the environment caused by other actors that we just can't perceive directly. So in the, in the Shaky the Robot uh, video, there's this uh, charming little part where I think Richard Fikes comes out dressed in a cape as the uh, gremlin to move a box uh, between when uh, Shaky actually was observing the world and so then it had to replan based on the box being in a new spot. And so that happens all the time in um, online advertising just because, you know, we know, for example, that we, we showed an ad to, uh, uh, to this guy and he went to the website and uh, uh, ended up, uh, again, let's just say buying shoes. Uh, but then we get the report the next day and it says, well, you didn't sell any shoes yesterday. And we're like, well, what the heck? I mean, I, I see it right there. But what we don't know is, you know, did someone else serve an ad in the meantime? Um, and so there's this uh, game theory kind of thing on multiple fronts between, um, uh, you know, uh, who's uh, showing ads to the user. Um, there's um, uh, the way we acquire uh, ad space uh, for the most part right now. That depends on the campaign, but we actually buy ad space on exchanges. So just as with Google, you can go in and say, I want to bid uh, $2 to show ads when someone searches on artificial intelligence, let's say. Um, you can go on these exchanges and say, well, I'll bid $1.50 uh, uh, per thousand impressions if I can find somebody in Texas, um, you know, who's uh, on a corporate speed connection, let's say. Um, but then, of course, there's all these other people bidding too, and their bids change over time. And so as their bids change, that dramatically influences the kind of audience that we get with our bids. And so um, kind of keeping up to date with all that is quite a chore. <laughs> so um, it's uh, similar to finance. If you um, look at quantitative finance papers, there's these papers on detecting regime change, which is when, you know, the stock market starts behaving differently than it did before, and you have to find out that that's happening before you continue on with strategies that were built in the previous regime. So this, uh, this notion of regime change is, uh, and, and it's, um, uh, you know, unseen effects only perceived indirectly are, are quite a challenge. Rob? Yeah, I think uh, following up on the theme that's been discussed is that just the c complexity of the real world versus what humans find to be trivial. You know, for, for in the computer world, it's trivial if you have enough power to de defeat a world chess champion, but to be able to look at an image and say, where is a person in an image? Uh, it, it just, it's, uh, you know, someone standing next to something, is that one thing? Someone walks behind a table, all of a sudden, oh, where'd half of them go? They're not there anymore. You know, so it just, you know, <laughs> you know things that we understand when we're two, you know, you try to train a computer, it's, it's, it's uh, just the, the complexity just is mind boggling. We, uh, when the robot's moving forward and its arm is in front of it, it says, I can't go forward, there's something there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the next one is for, for all the roboticists, I guess, even in the room. Um, would any of you like to sponsor the Gun High School Robotics team next year? <laughs> <laughs> no, no takers? If there's any takers, there's actually a, a phone number and an email address oh. on this card. <laughs> Um, th this might be a, a good question for, for, for Rob or, or Paul, and this is uh, about, so what's the status of organic bio coupled with AI, and would this be a useful avenue to, to, to go down? I guess wetware and hardware. Well, I might ask the questioner, I'm sure he or she is still here, whether you're talking about wet organic, like biological cells, or simulated circuits. You want to take that one, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. How can I uh, change the question and rephrase it? <laughs> so, um, I, well, I guess, I, I guess I'd answer with what uh, uh, I can't, I, I can't uh, pretend that I am familiar with that technology. So I would uh, 
say that, um, I, I guess I would change the question in a way to say that, uh, that our, com our uh, program is designed on um, an, really an ex explanatory model of how the brain works. Um, so we, when we think about biological, um, or I should say more accurately, when my engineers think about biological, they think more in terms of, you know, what, what is the flow of the, um, uh, the, the, the learning algorithms and the pooling algorithms and the hierarchy of the, of the you know, uh, you know the, the neurons in the brain. Um, but it really gets abstracted more toward, towards uh, mathematical models and algorithms by the time it gets to us. So the, the, probably if someone from Numenta was here, they could, they could give a better uh, answer than I can on that. You still want to weigh in, Paul? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I ducked the question because I guess I would say that there's really not much um, that I'm aware of. There's a whole field called brain-machine interface, which puts a pincushion of electrodes into human brain or primate brain, and then one can learn how to control things simply by altering uh, the patterns of firing in the neurons. I, I don't think that's really using wetware to build uh, artificial intelligent robotic things. Um, there's a, a nascent field, uh, guys at Georgia Tech do it, uh, Caltech, uh, where you have a dish of neurons under which is a grid of electrodes and uh, those are wet neurons and they make connections between each other but it's just a toy uh, system. So I'm not aware of anything wet that's moving towards say sensory motor integration at, uh, at this uh, point. On the theme of the rise of the machines, I'd ask which way is the control going when you have those electrodes in there? <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be going from the brain out. That's <laughs> how so you think. So uh, another question here is, um, do any of the solutions or, or products use human feedback to fine tune the, the technology? And I, maybe we can extend it just a slight little bit which is what data sets do you operate on and how is curating and labeling the data set accurately um, uh, an, an issue at you? And th this might be a, a question for some of the, the panel, maybe not all. So we used, um, we've been experimenting with Mechanical Turk to deal with uh, issues of perception. Um, and we talked about earlier about putting uh, people in the loop. You can take an image that the robot's seeing, and let's say you think you're looking at this table and you want to know where the water bottles are. You can take that image, you can post it on Mechanical Turk and offer 10 cents for somebody to circle the water bottle and you'll get back an answer. You may be a right answer, maybe a wrong answer. One of the cool things that one of our interns did this summer was they put up a different task on Mechanical Turk. That's how do you grade the other people who are answering Mechanical Turk. Mm -hmm. So you have people grading people who are answering the question that the robot wants answered. It's a, it's a very incestuous kind of thing. Um, what that allows is um, if you have a lot of robots and let's say the task that you give to the people on Mechanical Turk is labeling the, the water bottles, um, over time you collect a data set of labeled objects which you can then cluster together and say let me run machine learning over this and I no longer have to ask people anymore because I now have enough labeled training data that I can create a, an algorithm for detecting water bottles. I think that's a really interesting bootstrapping approach. Um, that can work um, and it's pretty inexpensive. So what sort of scale would you need for, 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 for this to, to work? So I mean, uh, I, I would imagine 10 robots are not quite enough to get a decent data set here. Uh, wh where would you need to be in, in the adoption cycle? I think, I think it depends on, on how many objects you want to be able to recognize and, um, and also what kind of response time you want. So one thing is you can put up a task on Mechanical Turk and ask, you know, offer a dollar to do something and eventually somebody will, if you offer enough money, somebody's going to do it pretty quick. And if you offer a reasonable amount of money, somebody will eventually do it. But if you have a stream of data, so if you've got 100 robots in the world and they're always putting up tasks, then you're going to find that somebody out in the world on the other side is actually saying, oh, this is pretty fun. I like it. you know, identifying objects and circling them. They get pretty good at it. And then you might get your latencies down to 10, 15 seconds which is pretty amazing because that's how long it was going to take your vision algorithm to decide that was a water bottle anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I was just in terms of uh, kind of leveraging human feedback, um, uh, I just thought of this when you mentioned the skill. So we, um, uh, we end up seeing um, over 100 million users a month and about half a billion events a month. So um, we have kind of a, a different part of the skill spectrum on uh, trying to leverage the human feedback because we're all about trying to 
uh, be kind to humans uh, here, the users who are seeing all these ads trying to you know, find things that are actually relevant, right? Um, so uh, feedback comes in, in a few forms, right? One is just kind of uh, observing um, uh, the behavior after seeing the ad, like do they actually click, did they buy the product, uh, did they visit the advertiser's websites, and uh, uh, sometimes as well, mechanical Turkish, I guess, it's also fairly um, traditional to uh, try to survey users as well, um, to understand if they recall the brand, if they think more fondly of the brand after seeing the ad than before. Um, so there's a, a mixture of um, uh, all these different types of, um, of interactions and responses we can get that are sort of uh, at the core of it all. We, we have a similar scale, except it's 100 million bugs per month rather than 100 million <laughs> really? interactions per month. Uh, yeah, so clearly we, we have a set of things that we do. Siri <coughs> determined a while ago that Siri doesn't care what humans think. So, no. A little joke that we give, just as an aside here, is that we, we, we will know specifically when the Turing test has, and, and the singularity has arrived, because we'll be asking Siri to book a table for two at, at El Fernayo, and Siri will say, no, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the, qu the quick answer is we, we, have, um, we, we do a variety of techniques. Some are manual in terms of grabbing, uh, watching what people are doing, and also there's, there's data sets in corpus that we aggregate in each domain that we automated uh, in an automated fashion. We check to see how we're doing and, and, and grade and, and judge and improve. So there's clearly a, a large human feedback element to what we're doing. And of course, our heritage is all about learning, and we will continually uh, apply new techniques to understanding personal preferences and other things that we're going to be caring more and more about over time. So, uh, Paul, in, in your work, you, you, you talked about um, exposing your, your, your machines to an environment in which they kind of grow up, for lack of a, a, a better term. So what, what do I need to imagine are, are these environments? And so what's your data set over which you're learning? Well, most people in the field uh, have traditionally used either still images uh, or, uh, or perhaps movies, uh, even just hours and hours of TV. Um, we like That's Rob, a really scary thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What kind of robot is that? Right? Uh, we, we, like Rob and, and uh, Numenta, know that uh, moving images are indispensable. Uh, still images are, are not the kind of sensory information that neural circuits used to uh, begin to learn to understand how to recognize objects. However, we, we also believe in bootstrapping the data set to not just start with the complexity of movies or TV, but rather to have a controlled, calibrated sequence of moving object uh, movies with more and more complex sets of objects, backgrounds, textures, colors, occlusion. And so we, com we, we have built engine, an engine to computer generate, uh, you know, uh, infinite, as many time steps as we want of movies of a, of a calibrated degree of complexity so that we can take our system in baby steps little by little uh, through the challenges of recognition. So a lot of the training data is uh, simulated movies. Of course, you know, these days you can make a movie that's rendered so, so lifelike you can't tell it isn't real. Okay. Yeah, I just give a short answer to this. We, we, we train our system with several hundred videos of people walking. And again, the, yeah, the, the point is agreed that uh, motion is very important. So it's very different from the approach of saying, uh, trying to apply a heuristic that says, oh, a human is, you know, has two arms and two legs. Because you apply that rule, then from where I'm sitting, I don't see any humans in this room. Because I don't see any legs. Um, so, but but uh, I won't go into the details, but part of the system is that if you teach it enough, if you show enough examples of people, it learns to generalize. So even if it sees no legs, it can still identify the motion as, so, as a human being. So I knew this question would come up, um, but I think I need to ask it anyway. What roadblocks <laughs> remain to making sentient general AI systems? So I guess uh, at what time do you think uh, we'll have uh, robotic overlords? <laughs> or, or nice robots? <laughs> Um, well, well I, I, just from the uh, Numenta perspective, I, I would say that um, uh, I don't see a path in their, um, uh, in their theory that gets us to sentience. So I can, I can see a path for creativity. I can see a path for um, uh, uh, different, you know, um, uh, much more complex types of thinking and prediction beyond human capabilities, but uh, there's no line from A to B for sentience that I see there. 
Uh, I'd love to tackle this one. I mean, who, who can resist this? Um, <laughs> You know, of course, the first point is that you would not have any way of knowing, would you, whether the machine had uh, an internal consciousness or not. It could just appear to be conscious. It could eventually react in so many ways that are so like conscious things that you would be constantly mistaking yourself for thinking it was conscious and not a machine. But you'd really never be able to know whether it was conscious. Of course, I could say the same thing, I suppose, about all the other members of the panel today. <laughs> <laughs> and they about me. We already did. <laughs> they, uh, um. so, so that's that's a bit of, I think, a, a straw, just not to, that's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a straw problem that's been around forever, you know, consciousness. Uh, you know, what, what, um, what, what, what you can expect, though, is that as rapidly as computing power and, and, and the understanding of brain-like systems is progressing, you can expect astonishing advances in things that appear to be intelligent uh, rapidly. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much in agreement with Rob on this one. I, I don't see a, a path there. I'm not, uh, I'm not optimistic about AI <coughs> getting to consciousness, uh, and I'm not like, I'm not worried about the singularity, for example. Um, I think if we do go in that direction where, we, where capabilities increase, they're going to end up increasing uh, for us as well, right? We have brain-machine interfaces. You know, we, people talk about, um, oh, it's going to be terrible or it's, it's scary when, ro when machines are much, much smarter than us. But it's really that the does those capabilities come forward and we learn how to understand, you know, how to play chess really well, for example, or how to um, search over billions of documents at a time or how to communicate with, you know, a million other people in a reasonable way. Um, as those things, as those capabilities come online, they enhance us and we become much smarter. I mean, if I think about, you know, myself uh, 30 years ago and what I could do versus what I can do today in terms of answering questions. 30 years ago, if you wanted to answer most questions, you went to the library, right? And, and except for, you know, borrowing novels, how many people go to the library very often anymore? Um, or I guess to study. Um, but for the most part, you know, you're not going to the library as an information resource. You're going to your computer or to your iPhone in your pocket. And that is augmenting our intelligence. But it's not consciousness, right? And, and I'm skeptical about whether it becomes consciousness, but... Um, I, I think even if it does become consciousness, we're going to have that helping us as well. And so we always have our edge um, from where I see. So an, another question here is, so what would you do or how would your product change if you had 10x or 100x or even 1,000x the compute power? What would you be able to do? If, if I had... A 100x or 1,000x the compute power, I'd be out of batteries in like 10 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> that's a great answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd actually say that's not the problem. I think that is the problem with AI today is people think, man, if we only had more processing power, we could solve this problem. Then my robot could pick up that bottle of water and we'd be good to go. It's sort of like the, the, the exciting thing about if you really make a breakthrough in understanding how cognition works, then you can, you can get, you know, you, you need that level. It's sort of like... In the, in the past, if I only had 100,000 slaves, I could do this, you know, and, and you've got to give them a shovel or you give them a bulldozer before they can really take that next leap forward. Yeah. We have, um, uh, so, so a lot of people know about a new breed of har parallel hardware, uh, GPUs, uh, like game cards, video cards. We have a rack uh, in our office that's a 40 teraflop, 40 trillion operations a second rack of GPUs that evolve neural systems and wire them during exposure to millions of time steps. And we could add more, and we are adding more, but um, it's like Rob said, it's not the computing power that holds back progress. It's understanding how these systems work. It, it is actually, I, I joke about the battery life, but we, we put a lot of compute power in the, I think a lot of compute power, we put basically two servers in the bottom of one robot, which isn't a, a, a lot. You could imagine increasing that by 100 times. What that would mean is, you know, the goofy planning algorithm that I was talking about that you could avoid if you're willing to spend 10 more seconds. Obviously, you don't have that anymore. You get smooth motion. Um, a lot of the perception algorithms you run, you could imagine running in parallel, you know, the bottle detector and the microphone detector and the, everything else. And so you can solve simple problems and just throw, you know, lots of compute hardware at it. It can actually help. 
um, I don't know if it's realistic to think you can actually get that much compute power because Moore's law isn't, Moore's law is running into power boundaries and power boundaries are a serious problem. The, the, the biggest problem we have is not compute power, it's um, wireless bandwidth so that we can get to a 40 teraflop cloud to help us solve the problems with, you know, real video data. I think I'd say, you know, the, um, I remember uh, before Deep Blue beat Kasparov and all that, you know, there was, uh, um, there used to be chess competitions <laughs> where uh, uh, hobbyists would have these chess playing programs to, to fight each other. And I remember, um, uh, you know, many years uh, the competition would be entered by, you know, massive companies with massive hardware and then some guy with his PC with uh, a, a better algorithm and, and the better algorithm was the win, right? It, it had, uh, um, by having better heuristics, whereas the other machines had to evaluate, you know, millions and millions of positions, he was evaluating tens of thousands, but he still won. It was called M-Chess back in the early 90s or something. So they, there's a lot of, um, it, it does feel like there's a lot of avenues where um, uh, at least the algorithms uh, make it feel like there's not a um, kind of a hard boundary that you're facing on the compute side. Um, I guess for us, you know, we use cloud computing, we use Amazon EC2, so if I want to throw more compute at something, I can just do it and pay for the five hours that I need and turn it off. So it feels like, um, uh, at least in today's world, and particularly because of the cloud, there's not a lot of um, uh, uh, constraints right now. One, one quick comment from our, from our perspective. It's, it's as much a performance issue and an economic issue for making things more intelligent as being able to afford the machines that you need to compute that. And for us, you know, we have we have issues related to performance that we uh, that would be helpful with with more compute power. But uh, across all of the various elements of the uh, of the platforms that we we reach, when we ask a simple question, there's all kinds of services. Some are slower and faster than others, and so on. And clearly, a performance issue for us is is, is one of those uh, affecting issues in, in terms of performance. But Economically, just the ability to afford, as a new company, uh, computation and, and the fact that that's getting cheaper and cheaper and, and more economical to try out these new systems is as important as anything else for us. So with that, uh, we, we didn't get to all of the questions, but we got to, to a large, uh, large amount. I wanted to, to, to thank the panel, in particular being so tolerant about uh, having a limited amount of time. And I, I would like to um, hand it off to Hiroshi, who is going to say a few closing remarks. All right, let's give Sven a round of applause for some tremendous moderating tonight. Thank you.